Welcome. Um, thank you for joining uh, for this important discussion on health equity and access to patient care. How can low-income patients and underserved populations get access to the health care they need? What barriers to health equity need to be addressed and reformed? And how do we move to a place where all Americans can afford the cost of prescription drugs. We will be joined this morning by a member of Congress and health experts who will shed light on this important issue. I'd like to thank the AIR 340B, the Alliance for Integrity and Reform, for their support of today's conversation. A few housekeeping notes before uh, we get started. Please keep your phones on silent for the duration of the program. And we do encourage you to join the conversation on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Hill Events, and we'll be using the hashtag, hashtag The Hill Health. We will be sending out an electronic survey after the event. We'd love your feedback. Please let us know how we can do better. And with that, it is now my pleasure to welcome our first guest this morning. Congress's Michael Burgess is a physician and represents Texas 26th District. He has served in Congress since 2003. He serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, Rules and Budget Committees. He is also chair of the GOP Doctors Caucus. Please welcome Congressman Burgess. Hey, thanks, thanks Bob. Congressman. Okay, so you know we. Uh, we have some pending legislation uh, in Congress. Uh, there, the House is trying to get out for the, for the August recess. Um, what do you see for the rest of the agenda? We've seen the Democrats' uh, Build Back Better program kind of dwindle. Uh, do you think anything will pass before the midterms? Um, well, the short answer to your question is yes. There are things that will pass. We'll name a ton of post offices. I'm sure there's some gold medals <laughs> that have yet to be awarded. <laughs> that kind um, of stuff. <laughs> Bill Back Better, I was not a big fan. Uh, last October when it was in the House, you know the twists and turns that have happened. Uh, I guess the drug pricing portion of that is, is capturing some measure of attention right now. Right. It's hard to tell where, and, and again, this is all... As a, as a House Republican, I'm in the minority and in the, the body that is actually not now working on this, so it's a little tough. But from what I see across the rotunda, um, seems like Senator Manchin is calling a lot of the shots right now, and we uh, are all interested in where he is eventually going to come down. But look, having been at this for a few years, uh, the 340B program, designed to help people who were in the in the toughest possible space and the, with the toughest possible conditions. And Congress, in its wisdom, created this program. And it seems to be working absolutely counter to what the intention was. And could we fix that? Should we fix that? The answer for me is a resounding yes. Look, full disclosure, I did a residency at Parkland Hospital, so every time I talk about 340B uh, program, I will get a call from Dr. Cerise who says, don't, don't hurt the 340B program, we depend on it. And I know you do. Par uh, the program, as it is being implemented by large public hospitals like Parkland Hospital, that is exactly what it was intended to do. But why in the world they decided to go down the contract pharmacy route in 2000? 2009, 2010, uh, is anybody's guess, but it's it's kind of like it's a it, it's counterintuitive. Instead of a, a Robin Hood where you're going to rob from the rich and give to the poor, <laughs> we're robbing from the poor and giving to the rich. So it doesn't make any sense. We did have some opportunities in the uh, two Congresses ago uh, when I was health subcommittee chair. We did have some opportunities. Our oversight and investigations subcommittee in energy and commerce did do a really detailed report on the 340B program. Uh, really highlighted some of the difficulties and, and where the, the system was falling short. Uh, it was a little more difficult than we got to the legislative committee, the health subcommittee. Uh, because there was uh, uh, there, there were a lot of conflicting influences, and then if you remember at the time, I think the administration, the Trump administration, came up with a rule that had upset some people. That ended up in right. the courts, yep. uh, and and so further sort of clouded the issue. But what we do know is HRSA has the responsibility for oversight of this program. They are not doing that. They need to do that. The contract sites that seemed like perhaps a good idea at the time. Uh, really seemed to be augmenting the bottom line of hospitals that were already doing very well and not helping the very people 
that uh, initially Congress had intended to help. My idea that I pushed when the Democrats were doing their HR3 bill several years ago is why, do, why not, in the 340B program, why not have the money follow the patient? And so I introduced that as an amendment when we marked up HR3 in October of 2019. It's a standalone bill that I will, again, introduce this Congress. And in the next Congress, uh, if you read the tea leaves properly, there's perhaps the possibility that there will be a, a, a different sort of mindset occupying the leadership positions in Congress. And it would be my hope that we could get some common sense reform, like a money follows the patient bill, at least heard in committee, if not passed and signed into law. You mentioned the midterm. I, I did want to ask about that. There, uh, House Republicans are planning to release an agenda uh, later this year. Uh, Senate Republicans are not going to do that. When will we see that agenda, and, and what will be on the, the health care side of it? Well, on, on, on the healthcare side, it's, uh, look, these next two years in the next Congress, Republicans may well be in, uh, in leadership in the House. Senate, I guess, is still an open question. Uh, don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> and uh, the White House is still going to be uh, a, a Democratic White House. No, no question about that. So... Most of the effort that you're going to see in the next two years, and I don't want to get ahead of the, of the leadership on the, on the committee or ahead of the leadership in the, in the Republican conference, but let's, let's focus on fixing some of the things that need to be fixed, that desperately need to be fixed. 340B is one of those things that desperately needs to be fixed. So rather than uh, a broad switch to consumer-directed health care, for example, which which in the past I've supported, uh, look, let's fix, let's fix some of the things that we can fix where there's broad agreement. And I think in the next Congress, and again, I don't want to speak for the committee leadership because that's obviously not me. I don't want to speak for the conference leadership because that's obviously not me. But uh, my goal would be to, again, let's fix some of these problems that we all know need fixing. We knew going into uh, to the Congress in 2017, 2018, that people in the Affordable Care Act couldn't, simply couldn't afford the premiums because of the, the subsidy cliff that occurred after you got to 400% of federal poverty limits, uh, no subsidy coming your way because of the phenomenon now known as silver loading, where the premiums are jacked up by the insurance companies for the silver plan, uh, because that's where their, uh, their, their money is uh, derived from. And the consequence was that a middle class family who earned over $96,000 a year in my district, that's a teacher and a policeman with two kids, they couldn't afford uh, their Affordable Care Act premiums. There were a number of things that were proposed to help deal with that. Uh, it obviously got distracted by all of the other political drama of the day, but that problem still needs to be tackled. Now, the Biden administration with the American Rescue Plan, you remember the American Rescue Plan, that's what provided you an inflationary level of 9%. But the American Rescue Plan increased the subsidy significantly um, so that families earning $250,000 a year now are included in the, in the subsidy window. Probably a little too generous. That program expires January for December 31st of this year. So before the next Congress takes, uh, uh, takes the reins, that's something that's going to have to be dealt with. That's a problem that exists that uh, it exists for middle class people who through no fault of their own are going to find themselves in this. Uh, Republicans and Democrats ought to have some interest in trying to get this problem solved. Uh, arguably the Democrats say we did, our, we did what was required of us, we increased the subsidy significantly, but the problem is you can increase it so significantly you can't afford it, and you could only pay for two years. Uh, now we're, we're, we're out beyond that. What could we do that is both innovative and respectful of the position that people are in uh, that would allow us to deal with this problem going forward. Those are the kinds of things we're going to have to talk about. And as you alluded, the, it is likely that the House will flip looking at history, looking at the president's polls numbers, and uh, independent handicappers have it mm -hmm. just under 90%. So if that, if and when the House does flip, 
Um, do you think that uh, the president is going to work with uh, the new House majority on health care? I mean, there have been some bipartisan bills over the years. I mean, I know there's been the, the Obamacare wars, and those <coughs> probably will continue to some degree. But uh, we, we've had right to try. We've had uh, 21st century Great. Oh, By the way, just but as, an, as an aside, but. when with the FDA was reauthorized the last time mm -hmm. on time, and mm -hmm. no one got their pink slips at the FDA, oh, who was in charge then? <laughs> well, um, yeah, right to try was a was a that great was a addition that to the FDA win. bill in yes. in 2017, and something that the former president talks still talks about. Um, so, do you think that there's hope for healthcare bipartisanship uh, in, next year? Well, there always is. Um, look, it, for whatever reason, um, this administration has not been um, really hasn't reached out. Now, it's not that I haven't reached out. I, I, I'm a prolific letter writer and, and write a lot of letters to... Uh, Did they get back to you? <laughs> ...cabinet secretaries <laughs> and to uh, committee chairs. Um, no, is the answer. And, and in that, fact... That could change next year. <laughs> you know, here's one of our problems, and this is aside from the healthcare space and aside from the 340B space, but we don't appropriate any longer the way we used to when I first got here. And an appropriation, we would, you know, the summertime, remember, open rules on appropriations bills, and they'd all come up, and every, every cabinet secretary would have an interest in their appropriations bill getting passed. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. We do some omnibus bills, and then a CR at the end of the year, and then maybe yeah. another omnibus, so that we have essentially removed ourselves as the average member of Congress from anything that would impact the intellect of a cabinet secretary. They just simply don't need to think about us. Um, one of the great uh, problems that I think we should try to fix is let's try to establish that part of regular order where the appropriations are done in an orderly fashion. Every cabinet secretary, of course, comes for the appropriations committee, comes for the authorizing committee. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. And as a consequence, when I write to a cabinet secretary and say, this is wrong and you need to be fixing this, uh, right now they're, they're not compelled to get back to me. Uh, took me about 18 months into the new administration to get a call back from some, uh, some cabinet secretary, and it just shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. um, as far as you're a doctor, uh, where are we and where are we going uh, with this pandemic, COVID-19? It's over. And what have we learned? <laughs> well, we're back in person, finally. This is our yes, second event. Uh, <clears throat> so things have changed, but obviously it's still, it's still here, and the president ha you know, has it, and uh, Schumer's gotten close. A lot of people got it. So obviously it's a different equation than it was two, two and a half years ago when, when this all started. And it, we all lived through it. It was pretty frightening at the, in the early days where you, where you didn't know how it was going to turn out. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> we can argue about the decisions were made in both administrations, uh, rightly or wrongly, but we've uh, ended up in a place where it's not the... Uh, Oh, it's, it's not the scourge that it was in January, or I guess February, March of, of 2020, 2020. Yep. When, when everything really, really came to a halt in this town. So we've at least reached a point where we are dealing with it. I know, you know, people will still have controversies on vaccines. Are they helping? Are they not? I think they are. Uh, I'm in interest of full disclosure, not violating HIPAA for myself. <laughs> a double vax, double boosted. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. There are other antivirals that have come along and uh, Have you gotten the disease? Because about a quarter of Congress has. Well, um, the short answer to your question is yes. I had a positive test, but I wasn't sick. Oh, interesting. Okay. So uh, over Christmas, when the president told us all to get tested, my wife said we had to test before we went to visit our kids, so I did, and, and we were both positive. I used it as a, an excuse to sit in the recliner for a full day and, uh, <laughs> and wine, but really I wasn't ill, right. and nor, nor was she, fortunately, which was vastly different from what it would have been uh, uh, December of a year prior. So, um, and, and I'll tell you another thing that is, is just extremely uncomfortable was the uh, just completely ignoring what natural immunity meant to a person. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> people who had the illness and recovered were discounted from, um, if there was a vaccine mandate, which the president pushed, they could still lose their job, even though they might have demonstrable 
uh, circulating antibody or T cell antibody in their system. And I know this because it, uh, um, when we were running out of monoclonal antibody in uh, March of 2021, and in Texas in particular, and Dr. Skakis had a telephone call with some of the people who were involved in making the decision. I offered to say, hey, I've had the vaccines. Could I, be, could I donate plasma for use for someone since we're running out of monoclonal antibodies? And I was told no, because it's people who have had the disease that have the type of antibody robustness that we need for convalescent plasma. Uh, so you, as someone who's just received the vaccine, are not... Uh, that's not going to be a suitable source. So that told me that there's really more work we need to do here. And then for whatever reason, uh, it, just, it just wasn't pursued. And the, and the mandates, which I, I deeply felt were not going to be a mechanism to get people to, get, to, to show up to be vaccinated. If there was hesitancy, you're probably not going to overcome that hesitancy with a, with a federal directive. Uh, it's, it's more show, don't tell. So that got us into a, a you know a tough place on the on on people whether they're going to be vaccinated or not, and people lost their jobs, and now we've got you know airline employees who were laid off and air traffic controllers who were laid off because they wouldn't conform to the mandates. And I don't know, has anybody flown lately? <laughs> That's a nightmare too. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd yeah. think we were over the pandemic and you wouldn't be scared to go to the airport anymore. Now I'm scared because I'm going to be stuck there for 13 hours before I leave. <laughs> um, I used to cover health care in, in 2003. The Republicans passed the biggest uh, expansion of, of Medicare. Uh, in 1998, the Balanced Budget Act made major changes to Medicare. Medicare right now is, is on a track that's not sustainable. Uh, when are policymakers going to have to address this because the system is going bankrupt and no one seems to be talking about it? Well, I like to talk about it. Okay, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about it. <laughs> and, I mean, because that, that's something the former President Trump didn't want to, he didn't want Medicare reform like Paul Ryan did and some others. Um, but what do you think is going forward? I mean, this is, it's not sustainable. Yeah, so something will have to happen. That, just like Social Security, when the trust fund gets exhausted, yes. there are decisions that are going to have to be made. And my, my, my thesis is we ought to, we ought to rationally approach those problems, do the, do the hard work in committees and our authorizing committees and, and come up with a, with a way forward. And, and for me, of course, coming, coming at this as someone who practiced medicine for several years, I, I, I feel with great intensity the discomfort that is voiced to me by physicians across the country who say the physician's fee schedule is proposed by Secretary Becerra is gonna drive us further out of business. As you know, I spent my first 13 years here trying to repeal sustainable growth rate formula mm -hmm. because I thought it was unfair to physicians. Problem is that things that have evolved since then have been, uh, ha have been no less injurious. And then the tough part is we came through the pandemic and we said, oh, doctors, nurses, you're our heroes. We sing songs to you at night. Uh, we laud you from the floor of the house. And uh, oh, by the way, here's your pay cut. And they went, wait, what? Why am I getting a pay cut for being your hero? And so if nothing else, just focusing on the physician's fee schedule, which I think if we will do that with, uh, with, with hearings and, and, uh, and collecting information and entertaining offsets and the types of things we would have to do on an authorizing committee, I think that will lead the way toward uh, what perhaps is some fundamental reform that, where, that, that people could live with. Uh, thank you for, for pointing out that uh, I was part of the Congress that corrected the problem with uh, leaving prescription drugs out of the coverage of Medicare. Yep. So President Bush, tip of the hat to you for, for fixing that problem. Medicare Advantage uh, occurred. That wasn't easy. <laughs> no. 15 minute vote was a three hour vote. Yeah. I was there that night. We've, yeah. we've, yeah. we've surpassed fun. that since then. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> no, it has been surpassed, yeah. I did want to ask, we have just about a minute left. Just the, what, with COVID, you know, I had never done a telehealth uh, appointment before, and, and now I've done several. I'm sure everyone has here. What's the, what's the future of telehealth uh, in the wake of uh, COVID? Well, telehealth, as you know, is existing right now under waivers that were granted by HHS because of the public health emergency. No one, no one thinks it's going to be acceptable to go back to the status quo. Now, there was a, there was a bill that uh, was in the Rules Committee yesterday, will be on the floor of the House to extend for two years in, 
statutorily extend for two years the uh, the waivers that have been granted. So that's a good idea, but we really ought to just we ought, ought to just fix it. I uh, was extremely grateful when uh, it's not just telehealth with a computer screen, but even a telephonic uh, conversation can now be uh, can now be a covered uh, event. I spent a lot of time on the telephone after hours when I was in practice, and I used to fantasize about getting paid for those phone calls. <laughs> now, apparently, you, you can. can get paid. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. But patients aren't going to go back. I mean, regardless of what, what legislators do, regardless of even what physicians do, uh, patients are going to demand that this improvement not go away, and no one's advocating to go back to the status quo before the COVID. Fact, uh, and, and the bill in the Rules Committee, is that is that going to pass easily? Has it got support from both sides, or no? Uh, uh, you know, like anything else, it gets gummed up with some other issues. Yeah. But uh, I, my expectation is that you will see that pass this week. I don't know what the Senate likelihood is. Mm-hmm. Well, we've run out of time. Please thank Congressman Burgess for joining us this morning. Thank you. Hey, thanks thanks so much.